Okay, today we're going to be in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And I'm reading from the New King James translation. Last time we ended at verse 18. As Jesus had shown grace and truth in cleansing the temple of sin and the corruption that had crept in uh, in the Passover celebration over the years. Our text today will begin at verse 16 and pick up the, to pick up the context, uh, and then I'll go all the way to the end of the chapter. Verse 16, And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said. Now we'll save verses 23 to 25 for a bit later. And last time uh, we shared, we saw that after Jesus had cleansed the temple, the Jews, meaning the Jewish leadership, didn't ask him why he had done those things or by what authority. They, I think they knew he was the Messiah. They simply asked for a sign. Our translations say Jesus responded, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, what is he really saying here? Uh, I, I find the wording in the Greek language to be fascinating, really. These three words, the three words destroy, temple, and raise up, are especially interesting. Now, the first word um, is luo. And that word appears 43 times in the New Testament. It's only twice translated as destroy. Most of the time, it's translated as loose or loosen. It's the same word that John the Baptizer used when he talked about he wasn't worthy to loosen the strap or loose the strap of Jesus' sandal. So he wasn't talking about destroying his sandal. He was talking about untying it, <laughs> freeing it from his foot. And so the, the general use of the word meant to free someone or something from bondage or loosening something from being tied together. Now, let's go to the next word that I find, find interesting, and that is the word for temple. Now, that could refer to the physical building, Herod's temple, that they were literally standing in at the moment. The word means a holy place set apart to be used by God or gods. But as a gospel writer quickly notes, Jesus was referring to his own body, which was set apart, as we know, to be used by God. As Messiah, it's well known that he was anointed to be used for God's purpose. In later scriptures, the bodies of we as Christians are also considered to be temples, holy places set apart to be used by God. But I'll, I'll give the leaders the benefit of the doubt here in this situation. Although they were supposed to know all of these things, uh, it was obviously obvious that they didn't really put these things together. And, you know, Jesus didn't mind saying things that caused the people that were listening around to understand uh, a little bit of the ignorance of these people that were supposed to be in the scriptures and know and should know better. And so it was it's just, just a very interesting conversation. Now, to the Jews at that point, it may have seemed that he was using an odd phrase. It'd be like Jesus saying, loosen this temple or take the bonds off of this temple or free this temple from bondage. But they took it to mean the destruction of the temple. I guess you could loosely say that's freeing the stones from each other, <laughs> from the, the temple. But, you know, construction of this temple, of Herod's temple, was an ongoing process. As you see here, it was uh, 46 years. It took almost 80 years altogether before that was finished. And so it was a, it's a huge process. And then, then we see the third interesting word that Jesus used. And he said, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, the word for raise up really was very clear and almost always meant to awaken someone from sleep or even to raise them from the dead or cause someone to rise up from a seat or a bed. Um, not on their own, but, you know, kind of with some help. And an occasional meaning would be to raise up a building like we used to have barn raisings out, out in the country. But that wasn't a very common use. 
But you know, people always have selective hearing. I won't say my wife ever accuses me of that, but people want to hear what they want to hear. They hear what they want to hear. They apply the meanings they want and they totally miss out on the point of what's being spoken sometimes. And so our life lesson here is that when we read God's word, study out what he's really saying and let him speak to you. When you read God's word, study out what he's really saying and let him speak to you. So we see by Jesus' actual words here, he wasn't speaking in riddles or a mysterious way, but it was just taken the wrong way and they jumped to the wrong conclusion. And verse 20, then the Jews said, it has taken us 46 years, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So by the time this was happening, there had been many reports of the teaching and the miracles of Jesus. Many of these people standing here had witnessed a lot of that. And of course, we know that Jesus performed countless uh, signs, miracles of love and compassion. Literally multitudes, by this time, multitudes of sick, lame, deaf, mute, blind, and even injured people were brought to Jesus and he healed them all. I, I find it interesting, the, the maimed, the, the injured people, they were brought to Jesus. That means, you know, they lost an arm or their leg was blown off in an explosion, I, I guess, or, or maybe cut off. A part of their body had been, been uh, you know, cancerous and been cut off. And Jesus healed. These things grew back on people. People were seeing amazing things from Jesus, and he healed them all. But these signs that he performed, each one of them had a purpose. And the purpose wasn't to show off. He wasn't saying, look. I'm a good guy. I'm a great guy. Look, I can heal you. Boom. No, he had compassion. It was to bless people. That was Jesus' nature, is to bless people. And of course, he taught, he taught them about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, how to live for God. That was all part of this, all part of this whole process together. And honestly, I'm, I'm sure that many of his teachings, as, as we have and as we see throughout the Bible, it, the teachings help us to avoid the illnesses and the heartaches and the injuries and, and many other things that a believer in Jesus can avoid because of following his teaching. Now, we see a little bit later on after about two years of him doing many miracles and teaching many, many times, probably every Sabbath in a synagogue in, in the town he was in, this same group came to Jesus again and again they asked for a frivolous sign. I say frivolous because obviously they weren't listening to his teaching, nor were they disabled or sick or hungry. They just had seen him. I mean, in, in just the verses right before what I'm going to read to you in Matthew, they had just seen him take five loaves of bread and a few fish, bless them, start breaking them apart and fed a crowd of five, uh, 4,000 men. This is the second time that it happened, uh, a mass feeding fed 4,000 men plus their wives that were there with them, plus the children that were there. And, you know, they're asking them this. And, and really, honestly, I, they just wanted to see him do another trick. Oh, show us something you can do. It says, Matthew 16, 1 says right there, Then the Sadducees and Pharisees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. They just seen it. But they're, oh, show us one. Give us one personally. Well, part of his reply included in verse 4, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. It doesn't say, and he left. It doesn't say, and he departed. It said, he left them and departed. <laughs> Basically, we see here how, how honestly, how gracious and, and kind Jesus had been back been there back after cleansing the temple when they asked for a sign. You know, back there, he told them what the sign would be. Now, this time after two years, um, likely with an audience that had seen him do many signs and wonders already, um, the truth needed to be made more obvious. And while not directly calling these religious leaders wicked and adulterous, the implication was unmistakable. And if you're, in case you're wondering, it's, it's not a strategy from how to win Flint how to win friends and influence people to uh, essentially call a leader a wicked, adulterous person, okay? Well, why did he call them that? Well, 
while they professed themselves as worshipers and teachers of the true and living God, they'd long since departed from him. I mean, truly what he wanted for them. They'd broken their covenants with him, like the covenant of marriage. That's what adultery does. It breaks the covenant of marriage. The Pharisees were a generation that were pure in their own eyes, in their own ways. But many had honestly gone astray from God, uh, metaphorically gone the way of sexually impure adulterers. Now this is, I don't know, I, I didn't know the people Jesus did. It could have literally meant that they were having sex with people that they weren't married to. Or it could have been spiritually, that they said that they were committed to God, but they were putting other things, politics, wealth, pride, prestige, or, or pleasures above that commitment. And he knew their hearts. But the worst thing about this is that these people were doing this thinking they were doing no wrong. And I think that's where we have a huge problem today in our own generation. And I'm not talking about adulterous sinners, people that don't claim the name of God. By definition, they are sinners. They sin. And then they do things that are against God. I'm talking about people who are practicing Christians. This is heartbreaking, brothers and sisters. These are people who go to church. A survey was done here. These are people that go to church at least monthly. They say their religious faith is very important in their life. But when Barno Research asked these people their opinion of the statement, they gave them this statement. Sex should only be between a man and a woman within marriage. Less than one third of these practicing Christians said, that's right. That is correct. And the younger they were, the less said so. In fact, only 16% of those 35 years old, under 35 years old, said that the biblical, this biblical standard of purity in marriage was right. Sadly, we are also now in a wicked and adulterous generation, uh, many more ways really than the Sadducees and Pharisees that we read about in the scriptures. So anyway, we need to pray for our, our, our brothers and sisters. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for the people sitting in the pews next to us. For those that, you know, that we that say they're Christians and come alongside and help them to follow Jesus. So Jesus, uh, let's get back. Jesus, instead of clearly telling them this second time they asked for a sign, instead of clearly telling him that he would be killed and would rise three days later as he did back in the temple, he told them the only sign that he would give them would be the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then he simply got up and left. <laughs> They're sitting there scratching their heads, you know, wondering, what is he talking about? Hopefully they went back and read the scriptures. Um, and for y'all today, I do want to encourage you to do the same thing. I want, you know, today, tomorrow, soon, read the book of Jonah and discover the sign that was given there. And, uh, and for, for extra credit, and if you're watching this on, uh, on Facebook, <laughs> Uh, you can put that in, in a comment. Bring, put down a list of the miracles that God performed in Jonah's life in the book of Jonah. And it might surprise you when you study it out. Now, something else surprising is that even the Sadducees and Pharisees help us find a life lesson in these two situations. The life lesson is that when you need a miracle in your life, study the scriptures. When you need a miracle in your life, study the scriptures. Now it's noteworthy also, and before reading the next verse, verse 22, I got to issue a spoiler alert. Once again, the gospel writer assumes that the reader knows the basic facts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. He's writing about these events and these teachings and, and information that he knew to be true and was an eyewitness to, and, but some of these things hadn't been widely known. So he does tell what he knows, but not only that, he also ties the importance of many of these details together for us. In verse 19, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And then in verse 22, therefore when he, Jesus, had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said to them and they believed the scripture which the, and the word which Jesus had said. So this was a very, also a very subtle and a strong indication of the integrity and the truth of the Bible. As if this had been a fairy tale, you, you know, you've, you read people say that 
you know, the detractors will say, Yo, this is a fairy tale. It's a book of fairy tales. It's all made up. If it had been a fairy tale, I'll tell you what, um, you would find a story here, but you would not find a spoiler here in chapter two out of 21 chapters. Um, you know, there, we're going to find quite a few more of these as we study through the Gospel of John. And there are, there are other things that would have been different too if this was just uh, uh, someone's imagination or someone's writing a story. Several times, John gives the location of the events after they occur. Doesn't seem like a big deal, but a, a fairy tale writer would have given the location first and then built up the scene and told why it was important that it was at this, at this location. And John doesn't do that. Or else they would just leave out the location altogether because it wouldn't matter. So in this situation, I, I would think that if it was a fairy tale, John would have written uh, about how happy people were to see Jesus uh, cleaning out the temple, cleaning the corruption out. And he would have given examples of the miracles that had occurred before the, uh, the, the evil men came into the picture, the, the, the bad guys in this story. I'm not saying they're always bad guys. The Pharisees are always bad guys. But in this case, they, were, uh, you know, they were, had the wrong motivations. But no, he didn't do that. John, the apostle, writing this book, just told the story as it happened. And he waited until the end of the book in John 1, uh, 21, 24 to say, this is the disciple. In other words, I am the disciple. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And as we've seen multitudes of times in just these first two chapters, we can trust the Bible to be the true, inspired, inerrant, and infallible word of God 100% of the time. Not only in our lives, but also we can trust our eternity to the word of God. Now, as we finish up the chapter, there's another question of trust. Can Jesus trust us? Or more personally, can Jesus trust you? And can Jesus trust me? Let's go to verse 23. Now, he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, and many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. The short and the long of these verses is that people saw the signs, the miracles that Jesus did at the feast. With hundreds and thousands of people coming through Jerusalem, you can imagine how many needy people were from all over the region, and Jesus loved them all. They had seen his action and his authority in the temple, and as we discussed last week, they weren't afraid of him. They were amazed by him and drawn to him. Many wondrous works were done. Word spread faster than wildfires in California of what Jesus was doing. But their belief, it was enough to get the conversations going and to get people excited, but was it enough for them to really trust in Jesus, to rely on him and to cling to Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Enough to stake their lives on that belief? Well, apparently not. When the scripture says he did not commit himself to them, it's saying he didn't commit himself to them into their care. He didn't entrust his message and his life into their hands because he knew all men. He knew how fickle they were. Sorry about that. He knew a lot of these folks would drop off the radar once they, had, once they started hearing the more difficult teachings he was going to give them. They would abandon the Messiah. And verse 25 says, He had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. They were believing in him for the wrong reasons. And he knew that when it came down to brass tacks, so to speak, they couldn't be trusted and couldn't truly believe him in him based solely on what they had seen. They needed to hear more of the Word of God. They needed to hear the teaching of the Word of God. And that said, his, his uh, signs that he had done were plenty enough to pique the interest in people whose hearts were beginning to open up to what his message would be. And that got people to listen to the message. And this whole, that's what the whole kingdom of heaven was about, the message that he would bring to man. In fact, if we see in the next verses, we're not going to study them out, but in John 3, 1 and 2, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, 
a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, in contrast to those that had developed a general belief in Jesus because of the signs he did, Nicodemus obviously was a little bit deeper thinker. He had heard his teachings. He had seen the miracles. He tried to put them all together. I, I'd like to think Nicodemus was probably one of those that were, were cheering on Jesus as he cleared the temple out and um, during this Passover season. And we'll get a lot more into that next week. So I look forward to sharing with you then. But before we finish today, I want to take a quick look at five things that are part of true faith in Jesus. You might want to take some notes. I'm not saying that every area that I touch on has to be fully developed for a person to be saved. But I will say that you'll find these validations in your life and the life of other believers as their faith matures in their Christian walk. Each of these things builds on the other as we mature in our Christian walk. The first thing is that Christian faith is based on real historical events. 1 Corinthians 15 recounts the critical core of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, which was referred to in our, our text today. Without the historical event of Jesus rising from the dead, there's no basis for our faith and no hope for a future in heaven. If Christianity is true, it must include certain historical facts and the Bible must preserve an accurate account of these events. In this sense, our belief depends on an accurate history. Now, the second thing, Christian faith is personal. Believing in Jesus is very different than believing that Jesus existed. Someone can even believe that the historical events surrounding the life, burial, and resurrection of Jesus are true. But it says in James 2.19, even the demons believe that God exists and shudder. Saving faith takes it to the next level. Believing in the reality that what Jesus did applies to you, applies to me. In Jesus' day, the common belief among the Jews was that they were saved because of their genetic connection to Abraham. They were children of Abraham, so of course they were God's people. However, Jesus makes it quite clear that faith must be personally applied based on their own personal decision and connection and commitment to Jesus. Our third thing out of five is Christian faith is verbal. Christian faith is verbal. The ancient world's oral tradition provides an important backdrop for our understanding of Scripture. Uh, we, we see Paul admonishes Timothy not to neglect the public reading of the Scriptures. This is also why Paul says in Romans uh, chapter 10, 9 to 10, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, except in unusual circumstances, a true disciple of Jesus must be ready to tell others about Jesus and make a public profession of faith by their words, and also through baptism, a sign, to show publicly that they've been saved, and also regularly sharing their faith with other people, with their mouth. If they can't talk, in other ways, you know, God, God has a way to, to use people no matter what situation they're in. That brings us to number four, Christian faith is practical. According to James 2.17, faith that isn't accompanied by actions is dead. It's not saving faith. True faith is not merely believing in the Bible, it's acting on the words of the Bible. Many times it involves risking a failure on, on your part, humanly speaking. When was the last time you stepped out in faith, taking a risk so big that you would fall on your face if Jesus didn't show himself through you? Act on your faith. In our lesson today, we see Jesus didn't trust the people because he knew the hearts of all men. But once Jesus can trust you in the small things, he'll be able to trust you in the larger things, in the bigger things he has in store for you. And you'll do extraordinary things that you'd never imagined. And you know when that starts? Now. It starts now. It's not too late, no matter how old you are. You're not too young, no matter how young you are, to start to step out in faith and do 
amazing things for God. They may not seem amazing to start with, but God will work that out in your life. And finally, number five, Christian faith is continual. Sometimes we tend to hinge our faith on a moment in time, a date when we first placed our personal trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, and yes, it's a necessary step and an awesome milestone for us uh, as, as we have come to Jesus. But scriptural faith finishes the race. It overcomes the world. It trusts and goes on trusting. It believes and goes on believing. It's not just a moment of faith that saves, although it would certainly be enough if someone's on their deathbed. You know, we saw a thief on the cross uh, that, that was saved as he was dying, and we've seen others that that's happened to. It's much better to start earlier in life, okay? Saving faith involves a lifetime of action that involves that faith. Saying what we sometimes call the sinner's prayer is not a magical incantation. It's the doorway to entering a life of obedience and living as a new creation. Bringing another person into faith means helping them weigh the evidence and coming to believe in Jesus. Sometimes we struggle with, with how to witness and how to, how to minister to people who are not quite ready to put their trust in Jesus. And sometimes we don't need to push them in that area. Sometimes it's just letting them know that we're there for them and also helping them work through their doubts and their, their questions is, is what they need in their life. Now, sometimes it's helping people understand how to practice their faith. Still others need to help, help build the faith in, in themselves so that it will last, helping them through those, those moments of doubt. Now, wherever we are in our journey of faith, our Heavenly Father wants us to truly abide in Him, to have a personal relationship with Him for now and eternity. And that way, not only can we believe in and trust in Him, He can also believe in and trust in us to, to do what he wants us to do. Just a quick review, our, number one, our faith is based on real historical events. Number two, our faith is personal. Number three, our faith is verbal, we speak our faith. Number four, our faith is practical. Number five, our faith is continual, okay? That was all a free bonus today. <laughs> so think about this, where are you in these faith levels today? And, and what does saving faith mean to you? What belief level are you at today? And can Jesus commit himself to you? We know we can trust him. Can he trust you? The Bible says to believe in him, trust in him, cling to him, rely on him, and he will do what he promised. And again, that starts at that point where we confess our sins to God. And as the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So start with that point. And thank God for his forgiveness. And then we'll continue to walk in that faith that he's given you. Brothers and sisters, uh, time's up for today. I want to encourage, to, uh, encourage you to continue to get to know Jesus more and more. Um, today's a great start. Listening to the teaching of God's word. Fellowshipping together. As we finish uh, John chapter 2 today, we'll pick up in chapter 3. Uh, we're going to see a totally confused Pharisee get a lesson that's been blessing the rest of the world for almost 2,000 years, okay? And if you have any questions about your relationship with Jesus or there's anything you'd like for us to pray about, please contact us and, and uh, don't hesitate to, to do that. And we'd love to pray for you. And I'd like to pray a blessing for you today as we finish. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you for being with us tonight.